When sun rays crown my pine-clad hills And summer spreads her hand When silvern voices tune thy rills We love thee smiling Newfoundland is an island of some 40,000 square miles situated in eastern Canada near the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It is the most easterly part in all of North America. Closely associated with the island is the 110,000 square mile Labrador coast on the mainland. Together they make up the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, the 10th province of Canada. Looking at the enlarged map of Newfoundland, we can see the rugged coastline that includes the Avalon Peninsula and the island's southeast corner. At the northern tip of this peninsula is the capital city, St. John's. The first Europeans on the island were probably Vikings, 500 years before the modern discovery of Newfoundland, arguably by John Cabot, sailing for England in 1497. Newfoundland was established as the first British colony after many years of temporary occupation during each fishing season. It was Sir Humphrey Gilbert who claimed Newfoundland for England in 1583. The island became a self-governing dominion in 1855. In 1928 a long-standing dispute between Newfoundland and Canada over ownership of the Labrador coast was finally settled in Newfoundland's favor. The Dominion of Newfoundland became insolvent during the Great Depression and reverted to Crown Colony status in 1933. It retained that status until 1949 when by referendum it chose to become a province of the Dominion of Canada. The Newfoundland surface mail stamps cover a 90-year period, 1857 to 1947. In discussing them, it's convenient to divide these stamps into seven groups, mostly according to which banknote company produced the stamps. First was the Pence issue of 1857 to 61, the product of Perkins Bacon and Company. This was followed by decimal issues produced by the American Engravers, American Banknote Company, ABN, and the National Banknote Company, NBN, between 1865 and 1879. Then the Dominion stamps were produced by a Canadian company, the British American Banknote Company, BABN, between 1880 and 1898. In 1897, Newfoundland stamp production was given back to the American Banknote Company, a situation which lasted until 1908. Then we see a period of almost 30 years where English engravers received the island's stamp contracts. In 1941 begins the final period in which the stamps were produced by both English and Canadian engravers. Topping things off is a group of provisional issues which spans the entire period of the surface mail stamps. From the previous slide, we've seen that it is convenient to divide the Newfoundland stamp issues at least partly based on the banknote companies that produced them. Noting the origin company becomes particularly important when comparing stamp designs or issues that were copied from each other. In this slide, all of the banknote companies that produce Newfoundland stamps are listed. The American companies include the ABN and NBN. The Canadian companies include the BABN and the CBN, or Canadian Banknote Company, which at that time was a branch of the ABN. While the British companies include Perkins Bacon, Delarue, McDonald and Sons, Waterloo, and Bradbury Wilkinson. 
In the Newfoundland stamp series, one sometimes encounters successive issues that look similar, sometimes almost identical. Because there is some confusion surrounding this, and because of the way stamp catalogs tend to cover copied designs, it is worth taking the time here to go over some definitions and examples before getting into the full details of each issue. In this slide, we see three types of relationships between pairs of similar design stamps. Theme copy, facsimile copy, and re-engraved die. The theme copy is where the later design has only been loosely copied from the first. It's obvious that the stamps portray the same subject, but they're generally easily told apart. In a facsimile copy, a greater effort has been made to faithfully copy every part of the original. Facsimile copies usually appear identical at first glance and are differentiated only after careful inspection usually under magnification. It should be emphasized, however, that both our, the theme and the facsimile copy are still just copies, and each is derived from a completely new die compared to the original. With a re-engraved die, the die of the later stamp is derived directly from that of the starting stamp via an intermediary called a roll. Some parts of the design are altered during the re-engraving process, but most parts remain identical. Because of the fundamental difference between copies and two stamps related by the re-engraving process, in this presentation we will not use the term re-engrave to characterize copies. Here's a nice example of a theme copy. The ABN original on the left and the BABN copy on the right. The codfish are very similar, although independent engravings. Note the fine detail of the tail. But the frame and counters are strikingly dissimilar. The two steamer stamps in this slide look identical at first, except for a slight color difference. But this is an example of a facsimile copy. The two stamps were engraved by two different companies. In this magnified view, we can see a point of clear difference between the two designs. The flag at the stern of the ship. In the earlier version on the left, the top of the flag is well below the height of the davit at its left. A davit is a kind of pulley with a curved top that is used for raising or lowering a lifeboat. On the later version at the right, the top of the flag is well above the top of the davit. With this pair of five cent caribou stamps, we see an example of a re-engraved die. The Scott catalog calls them die one and die two. The most obvious differences are in the height of the antler tip under the T of postage and the amount of shading behind the letters above five cents at the bottom. Let's look at these differences under greater magnification. With die one at the left, the antler tip under the T of postage is the same height as the adjacent tip under the S. On die two, it's slightly higher. With die two at the bottom, the shading behind the words above five cents has been considerably lightened compared to die one. These changes give us an example of true re-engraving. With the definitions in hand, we can now proceed to the details of the individual issues. Newfoundland was afforded the right to issue postage stamps in 1851. However, no progress was made for several years because the colonial government was then preoccupied with gaining self-government. Finally, Newfoundland was granted dominion status in 1855 and more mundane matters like postage stamps could be addressed. The first order of stamps was placed with the British company, Perkins Bacon, 
and the finished stamps were received in late 1856 for issue in early 1857. The nine values were in local pound shillings and pence, and the designs were in one of three formats. First was a square with a crown in the center surrounded by United Kingdom heraldic flowers used for the one and five pence. Second was a triangle with heraldic flowers in the center used for the three pence only. And third was a rectangle with a white circle or oval in the center containing heraldic flowers used for two, four, six, six and a half, and eight pence, and the one shilling. The existence of such an unusual value as the six and a half pence, or six pence half penny, as it says on the stamp, merits explanation. That value paid the postage for a packet boat letter to the UK. The British Post Office bore the cost of commissioning the packet boats. Consequently, most of the postage from that stamp went to them. The packet rate was six pence sterling, or British money, of which five pence went to the British Post Office. Since the stamps were in the local Newfoundland currency, and the Newfoundland pound was pegged at slightly less than sterling, the stamp had to be six and a half pence Newfoundland currency to pay the six pence sterling fee. The pence issue stamps were produced in four printings between 1856 and 1861. Being able to differentiate the products of these printings becomes important, especially with the rectangles. With them, properly identifying the printing can make a $20,000 or more difference in the market value of the stamp. The printings can be sorted by color and paper. The first printing, 1856, was in scarlet vermilion on a thick opaque paper which shows mesh. Most of the first issue rectangles are quite valuable, even in used. The stamps of the second printing, 1860, are relatively easy to spot by their color because they are much more in the middle orange range. Also, the paper is not as thick or opaque as the first issue, and it shows little or no mesh. Most of the second issue rectangles are also valuable. The stamps of the third and fourth printings, both in 1861, are much less valuable and are readily obtained. Their color is rose, the third issue somewhat darker than the fourth. The paper is the same as the second issue. Adoption of the decimal system of currency, where two pence in the old system equaled one cent in the new, prompted the issue of the first decimal stamps in 1865. The six values were engraved by the ABN. Their themes represented the island's commercial interests or showed portraits of the royal family. The two cent depicts a codfish for the fishing industry and paid the rate for drop letters and newspapers. The five cent shows a harp seal with its clawed front flippers to recognize the sealing fishery, and it paid the rate for half ounce domestic letters. The ten cent features a posthumous portrait of Albert, the Prince Consort, who had died in December 1861, and it paid the rate for double weight domestic letters. The 12th cent with a portrait of Victoria previously used on the Nova Scotia, one, two, and five cent paid the rate for a letter to the UK. The 13th cent features a schooner representing commerce and it paid the rate for a letter to the US. Finally, the 24th cent with a portrait based on a painting by Franz Winterhalter and previously used on the Nova Scotia 8.5 cent, 10 cent, and 12.5 cent stamps, paid the rate for a double rate domestic letter. 
The first changes in the decimal series appeared in 1868. The color of the five cent seal was changed to black from its previous brown. Then there were three new values due to reductions in postal rates. The first, also in 1868, was a one cent stamp depicting the young Prince of Wales, later Edward VII, in Scottish Highland costume. This was the work of the National Banknote Company in New York and was the only stamp it engraved for the Dominion. Then in 1870 came three and six cent values for single weight and double weight domestic letters engraved by the ABN. When existing values were reordered in 1871 to 74, the colors were changed. The one cent was brown lilac instead of purple. The three cent was blue instead of vermilion. And the six cent was bright rose instead of pale rose. But let's take a closer look at that one cent. The 1871 printing wasn't just a new issue from National Banknote Company plates. It was a theme copy from the new plates engraved by the ABN. The enlargements in this slide allow us to zero in on the differences, of which there are many. But I'll just focus on three. First, the facial details are quite different. To my mind, the NBN version on the left is superior. Second, on the NBN version, the lower edge of the denominational banner breaks the oval, and on the ABN copy, it doesn't. And third, the white gaps under the denominational banner are rather larger on the ABN version at the right. In 1876-79, reorders of the 1, 2, 3, and 5 cent ABN values were made. There are two differences compared to the earlier printings. First, the color of the 5 cent seal was changed yet again, this time to blue, which is a bit surprising since the 3 cent was blue. And second, the stamps were rouletted. The question arises, did the Newfoundland government request the stamps to be rouletted, or was it an independent decision by the ABN? I think it was the latter. Note that the ABN issues for two of its foreign customers, Brazil and Uruguay, during the same period were also rouletted. The rouletting most likely reflects a lack of sufficient perforating capacity at the ABN during that time. The Newfoundland government changed engravers in 1880, selecting an up-and-coming company in Canada, the British American Banknote Company. The BABN had become the preferred engraver for the Dominion of Canada for everything from paper money right down to revenue stamps. They had excellent engravers at that time and produced outstanding work. Their first issue for Newfoundland, introduced in 1880-82, to 82, was a set of four stamps, all theme copies of the previous ABN issues. Let's look at each of them with the previous ABN issue at the left for comparison. The Prince of Wales one cent is a particularly striking example of the superiority of BABN's work with its strong engraving and accuracy of depiction. The two cent codfish pair has already been shown previously. Note the frame design difference where the BABN version is cleaner with fewer counters. The Victoria three cent is another example of BABN's fine work with its superior rendition of Victoria. And finally, the BABN 5 cent stamp shows a different type seal, probably a gray seal, lacking the front feet and claws of ABN's harp seal. 
In 1887, the BABN 1, 2, 3, and 5 cent designs were reissued in new colors. The 1 cent changed from brown to green and the 2 cent changed from green to orange. The 3 cent changed from blue to brown, correcting the previous error of having the 3 and 5 cent both blue and the five cent changed to a darker blue. The reduction in postal rates prompted a new value and the reintroduction of an old one in 1887 to 88. A rose red half cent with a white faced Labrador dog, the world's first dog stamp, paid the newspaper rate. And the reintroduced 10 cent value paid the rate for a letter to the US. Note that its schooner theme was consistent with the design of the 1865 13 cent stamp intended for the same use. In 1890, a quite unusual design with a small bust of Victoria replaced the existing more traditional large portrait design. The 1890 issue has several color varieties only three of which are shown here, but you get the idea. At least some of these varieties we see today are surely due to the fugitive nature of some of the pigments used. In 1894, orders were placed for fresh supplies of four values, two engraved by the BABN and two engraved by the ABN for the six cent and 12 cent, which the British American had not been called upon to engrave. All were printed by the British American Banknote Company in Montreal. All four of these values were in colors different from previous printings. The half cent Labrador dog changed from rose red to black, much more in keeping with the dog in real life. And the five cent seal was still blue, but it was in a lighter blue which the catalogs characterize as bright blue. The six cent Victoria was in a stunning Carmen Lake instead of the previous bright rose. And the 12 cent Victoria was in deep brown red, sometimes called chestnut, instead of the previous pale red brown. Two years later, in 1896, a very unusual printing was ordered from the BABN plates. It was special because four of the five stamps were in either a superseded color or design. The half cent dog stamp, the current color of which was black, was printed in orange, simulating the original 1887 color of rose red. The one cent was printed in a brown close to the superseded 1880 color and it was also printed in the current color green. The two cent was printed in green somewhat darker than the original 1882 color. The current color was orange. And the three cent Victoria was of a type that had been replaced by the 1893 cent small head Victoria. Another unusual feature of the 1896 issue was the immodest amounts printed, 20,000 of each stamp. In fact, the purpose of this issue was largely to replace stocks of previous issues for philatelic purposes. That is, the stamps were produced so they would be available to stamp collectors. Since the 1896 printings were made available for sale at the post office and could be used for postage, they are technically reissues rather than reprints. Then in 1898 came a final printing from the BABN half, one, and two cent plates, all in the current colors. This issue was probably ordered as a stopgap to provide a supply of these values while the government awaited the arrival of stamps of the royal family designs, the current issue. And so ends part one of our story. Thank you.